A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 1 for Biology 2420. That's Microbiology for Non-Science Majors. Chapter 1 covers a brief history of microbiology, so it's a relatively short chapter, but an important uh, primer for the course. Uh, in the early years of microbiology, you have to understand that before microbiology came along, uh, people didn't understand that microbes existed. They didn't understand that they caused disease and uh, they had so much diversity. So once we were able to identify these microbes, that's when we started to learn all of these important roles that they play. Uh, it was really early pioneers such as Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was an, actually his main job was as a haberdasher. And if you don't know what that means, that means that he would, uh, men's outfitter, he would uh, outfit men with suits and top hats and canes and, and whatnot. And on his free time, his hobby was uh, making these crude pinhole microscopes. So this is an example of one of his early microscopes, which allowed him to gain magnification uh, a decent amount of magnification. If I remember correctly, it was about 200 or 300 times magnification with this little pinhole microscope. You place your specimen on this needle, you look through the pinhole, which has a lens in it, and you can magnify the image on that pin. And through that, he was able to see these tiny, tiny organisms, which included fungi, algae, and single cell protozoa. These he called animal animalcules sort of like molecules but small animals uh, now we know we no longer call them animalcules we call them fungi algae protozoa and later on we found out that there's even more small creatures uh, including bacteria archaea things like that as well which are even smaller and unable to be seen with his crude microscope but by the end of the 19th century, now we call these organisms microorganisms. Um, and that's really what you're going to be studying in microbiology. You're here to learn about microbiology. And what is microbiology? Microbiology is the study of microorganisms. And I'm going to tell you what organisms uh, encompass microorganisms, what organisms are under the umbrella, I should say, of microorganisms. So how can these microbes be classified? Like I said, what organisms are we going to be studying in this class? Again, these are organisms that are smaller than what you can see with the naked eye. This is about 0.2 microns, right? These are, uh, I should say, sorry, 0.2 millimeters or 200 micrometers. These are creatures that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. You know what a millimeter is, right? A millimeter well think about 0.2 of a millimeter that's about the resolution limit of an eye anything smaller than 0.2 of a millimeter you really can't see it with the naked eye and your naked eye needs assistance of a microscope or some such device to see it these are the that's the realm of microbiology these microorganisms are smaller than 0.2 of a millimeter and so you need a microscope to see them. And these organisms include bacteria, um, I'm sorry, bacteria, archaea, fungi, especially the spores of fungi, protozoa, algae, and we're going to cover some other small uh, multicellular animals as well. Don't forget that this, that Th these creatures encompass all three domains of life. Do you guys remember from Biology 1406 or Basic Bio that there are three main domains of life and all living organisms fall under one of those three main domains of life? Um, there's bacteria, that's a domain of life. Archaea, that's a domain of life. And then the third one is eukarya, which you and I belong to. That's a domain of life. So there are members of all three domains of life that fall under the umbrella of microorganisms. So let's cover these. Bacteria and archaea obviously are prokaryotic creatures. They are unicellular. They lack nuclei. Remember, prokaryotes by definition lack a nuclei. They lack 
multi they lack uh, intracellular um, membrane bound organelles such as they lack uh, mitochondria they lack chloroplasts they lack the nucleus they lack endoplasmic reticulum they lack all of that stuff because those are all membrane bound organelles okay so they are smaller because they lack all this stuff and they're much simpler than eukaryotes they are much smaller than eukaryotes and that's why if we go back to this slide here um, notice with uh, Lewin hooks early microscope it was only able to see eukaryotic creatures see fungi algae protozoa these are eukaryotic creatures eukaryotic microorganisms are still much bigger than prokaryotic microorganisms prokaryotic microorganisms are the bacteria and the archaea okay so these bacteria and archaea are found everywhere especially the archaea archaea can live in live in extreme environments such as acidic salty cold hot uh, very extreme environments, whereas the bacteria, uh, they, they, they are ubiquitous, which means they're all over the place, but they tend to be in less extreme environments than the archaea do. These reproduce asexually, uh, and bacteria in particular, you should know, uh, bacteria have a cell wall, and that cell wall is comprised of peptidoglycan. Just like, do you guys remember that you learned that plants have a cell wall? and the cell wall of plants is made out of cellulose well bacteria have a cell wall usually and that cell wall is made of peptidoglycan archaea on the other hand they also have cell walls but their cell wall is not composed of peptidoglycan the cell wall is composed of various polymers now let's talk about the eukaryotic microorganisms these include the fungi. You've, you've heard of fungus and fungi. These are eukaryotic, so they're much bigger than the archaea or the bacteria because those are prokaryotic. Eukaryotic organisms have membrane-bound nucleus, membrane-bound organelles. Uh, fungi have cell walls. In fact, the cell wall is comprised of chitin. Uh, these fungi include what are called the molds, and the yeasts. There's a big difference between molds and yeasts. They're both fungi, however, molds are multicellular and grow as filaments called hyphae. Yeasts, on the other hand, are unicellular uh, and they reproduce, uh, I'm sorry, they, yeasts are multicellular and they are semicircular oblong cells. So you see here, these on the top these are hyphal mold cells, whereas here, down here at the bottom left, these are semicircular yeast cells. Notice that they're oblong shape. And yeast cells actually reproduce by budding, which means a small bud uh, uh, forms and then it pinches off as a whole new yeast cell. Whereas with molds, molds form these spores and the spores disseminate, which means spread. Now let's look at some more microorganisms. These are still eukaryotic microorganisms. How about the protozoa? These are types of protists. Do you guys remember protists from, back, uh, from Bio 1? Uh, protists are usually, but not always, single cell eukaryotes. And there are many different examples. It's quite a diverse group. So let's talk about the protozoa, which is a type of um, protist. Okay, these are types types of protists. The protozoa are a group of protists. These are single cell eukaryotes, similar to animals in their nutrient needs and cell structure. What is it, what does the nutrient need means? That means uh, they ingest uh, sugars and things like that, and burn those uh, sugars or fats for energy. They usually live in moist environments. They can do asexual or sexual reproduction. Usually asexual though. And what you need to know about the protozoa is that besides that, besides the fact that it's a diverse group of organisms, 
the way you characterize protozoa is by how they move, their mechanism of motility, which means how they move. Some have pseudopods, which means fake feet, like this amoeba here. Some are ciliated, which means they have these hair-like protrusions that allow them to propel through the water. Some are flagellated, which means they've got this long whip-like structure that allows them to propel through uh, fluids. And some actually don't move at all. For example, plasmodium is a type of protozoa, and that organism, is, it doesn't move at all. It, does, has, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have a, a, a mechanism to uh, move about. It's, it's a... Um, flagellated it's it's a uh, it does not have a form of motility okay so you could also have protozoa that cannot move or they are intracellular parasites which means they are creatures that invade your cells and live within those cells what about algae algae is also a type of protist Algaes are, al are, again, eukaryotic microorganisms, but these can be unicellular or multicellular. They are photosynthetic. You've seen algae in ponds and some swimming pools that aren't treated correctly. That's what that green color comes from in the pond, right? Algae, photosynthetic uh, microorganisms. And these also have a cell wall. Now, here's some interesting stuff. In addition to those members uh, we just talked about, which fall under the realm of microbiology, those creatures that we just talked about, there are more uh, creatures that are uh, studied. For example, parasites. Let's talk about worms, okay? Microorganisms uh, include worms. Why? Because um, when, when you become sick with worms, it's not the macroscopic or the large worm you probably ingested, right? What are these little dots here? You see these little dots everywhere? These dots are eggs, right? These are worm eggs. Worm eggs are usually too small to be spotted with the naked eye. And when you ingest worm eggs by, let's say, drinking unfiltered water, untreated water, or eating contaminated food or undercooked food, you can ingest worm eggs. And those worm eggs uh, grow to form the macroscopic, the large worm. And that worm is now an infection. It's a parasite living within your body, right? So uh, microbiology includes the study of parasites such as worms because usually the form that you were infected with is microscopic. So an interesting fact that although worms can be quite long and quite visible with the naked eye, we still study them under the realm of microbiology because when you were infected, you probably didn't see it. Okay. Now, what about viruses? What do you know about viruses? Are viruses alive? Think about that for a minute. Are viruses alive? The answer is no. You want to know why? Do you remember I said that there are three domains of life? What were they? The three domains of life are bacteria, archaea, and what was the other one? Eukarya. And I told you that all living organisms uh, fall under one of these three domains of life well what does you what does a virus fall under it doesn't right a virus is not a bacteria a virus is not a archaea a virus is not a eukarya so viruses aren't alive okay you should understand that viruses are not organisms they are not alive they fall under this umbrella of small infectious agents. So if you were talking about a virus, you shouldn't say it's an organism. You should call it a infectious agent or a small infectious agent. It's uh, something that's not technically alive. Okay, But because they cause so much damage, because they cause human disease, they, and because they are so small, um, smaller than what can be seen with the naked eye, much smaller than even prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea, we study them under the realm of microbiology. 
Okay, so let's take a quick break and then we'll come back to this introduction to microbiology and I'm going to tell you some of the early pioneers of microbiology and how they answered some of the early questions uh, in the world of this uh, field. All right, so we'll be right back, but enjoy a break time with TIG and we'll be right back with more. Hey, welcome back. So let's get started with the golden age of microbiology. What early questions did microbiologists solve? Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. First, the, the first major question uh, that humans had about life uh, that microbiologists were able to um, solve was, does spontaneous generation occur? Specifically, does spontaneous generation of microbial life occur? So what is spontaneous generation? What does that mean? Uh, well, some philosophers and scientists of the past thought living things can come from unliving things. So for example, if you left a piece of meat out, uh, you would notice that maggots would grow out from the meat, right? So did those maggots come from the dead meat? Did the life come from non-life? That's what spontaneous generation means. Uh, so this was not a uh, uncommon thought back then. Uh, and back then, I mean before the 1800s. Uh, Aristotle proposed the spontaneous generation, that living things can come from non-living matter. So let's take a look here. Why does meat spoil in such a way that maggots come out of it? Uh, are those maggots born from the meat? Did life come from non-living organism, dead tissue? Well, to address this, we had Francisco Reddy. Francisco Reddy was an early microbiologist who set out to solve this question of spontaneous generation and he did so with his three jar experiment a very elegant simple uh, experiment he's put a piece of meat in an open jar a piece of meat in a sealed jar and a piece of meat in a jar that's covered with a gauze like a, a mesh okay which allows airflow what did we see he saw that after a short period of time the meat in the uncovered jar uh, produced maggots. There were maggots all over the meat. The meat in the sealed jar had no maggots, but maybe this is because oxygen wasn't getting in. Remember, oxygen is vital for most life. So if oxygen can't get in or out, that might explain why the maggots weren't born. But take a look at the third jar here. This was the... Um, definitive part of the experiment. This is the part where the meat was free of maggots, but maggots did form on the gauze, on top of the gauze, suggesting that life was not forming from the meat. Life was being brought to the meat, and it was brought in the form of the parents, these flies, these pregnant flies. Okay, so Francisco Reddy helped to show that at least macroorganisms, these insects, cannot spawn from dead tissue. But what about microorganisms? Can bacteria come from dead tissues? Can, can other m microorganisms come from non-living matter? Well, to answer this, a uh, rock star in the field of mic uh, microbiology, Louis Pasteur, came along. And he set out to address this question. Can microorganisms spawn from non-living matter? Here's Louis, uh, a portrait of Louis Pasteur. So what he did was he knew that if you had br uh, broth, you know, like soup broth, that if you have soup broth and you set the broth out for a period of time, the broth becomes contaminated with microorganisms. So what he did was he hypothesized that just like Francisco Reddy, how the, how the organisms are being brought to the meat, perhaps the organisms are being brought to the broth and spoiling the broth by, by coming from the uh, uh, environment to the broth. So what he did was a very, very elegant experiment where he took a flask 
and then with heat he he made the neck of the flask into this what's called a swan neck you see so it's a hollow tube but it's a swan neck so with with the help of fire he elongated this neck into a swan neck now why why did he do this well that's because air can still pass steam can still leave while the broth is boiling right the the broth is boiling so you're killing most of the microorganisms steam can escape but more importantly air can move in and out of the flask so if something was living in here it would not suffocate so you would not get this problem air could get in air could get out right uh, but look what happens dust from the air settles in the bend so let's say there's dust in the air the dust could travel in but it'll invariably stick to the neck of the swan neck it will the dust will not come in lift up go down and land in the broth why is this important well fast forward to 2020 fast forward to today we know why that's important well because uh, we know today that dust can harbor microorganisms bacteria uh, you know fungi things like that or they could piggyback on dust they could float around in the air and one of the reasons why your soup spoils when you leave your soup out is because dust particles with bacteria piggybacking on top land in the food and those bacteria start to divide and divide and divide right so notice what Pasteur showed this infusion this broth remains sterile indefinitely so you could leave this soup out for days and days and weeks and months and it won't spoil why because all the dust is settled here now you know what else he did he broke the neck right he broke this glass neck right about here he would break it and guess what within a week it was totally spoiled because the dust can now settle in interesting so what did Pasteur just accomplish he showed that uh, spontaneous generation does not occur okay uh, there this was the nail in the coffin for the concept of spontaneous generation and one of the first of four major questions actually there were more than four but one of the first major questions solved uh, for humanity by microbiology what was another major question uh, for humanity at the time right what causes fermentation um, did you know back in the day they discovered how to make wine and other alcohols but they didn't really understand how the alcohol forms right uh, they didn't understand this process of fermentation at all imagine how hard would it be to make wine or beer or rum if you have no clue that yeast are playing a role right you know that that there's a uh, uh, this concept of fermentation uh, but people tried and this is why early batches of wine were so uh, uh, varied in their potency and their taste because early vintners and vintners being people who make wine uh, they didn't understand uh, how the exact process of uh, alcohol production was going on so you know what they did these vintners they hired uh, they hired none other than Louis Pasteur the Vintners hired Louis Pasteur because Louis Pasteur was a chemist and you know the Vintners they thought that wine had something to do or alcohol production had something to do with a chemical reaction that's not absurd I mean if you think about it alcohol is a chemical and something to do with the process of winemaking produce this chemical ethanol right alcohol ethyl alcohol so they hired Louis Pasteur who's a known chemist to study and what did Louis Pasteur dis, uh, uh, to uh, what did he discover uh, well he discovered that yeasts yeasts are important in the fermentation product it was actually he used his swan neck uh, approach and he discovered that these microorganisms these tiny organisms are vital in the production of the alcohol without these microorganisms without these yeast which are actually eukaryotic microorganisms you guys remember from an earlier slide I said that yeasts 
are a type of fungi, which is a eukaryote, and the yeasts are roundish cells, kind of oblong cells. Well, guess what? These yeasts are organisms that conduct the process of fermentation. They, they essentially convert sugar into alcohol. And later on in another chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 5, we are going to discuss how exactly this fermentation process works. Okay, we're going to talk about that. So guess what? Now, Louis Pasteur was able to inform these vintners that yeast is important. Yeast is a living organism. Yeast is the reason why the alcohol is produced. And from that conclusion, from those results, the vintners were able to make sure yeast was introduced into each batch, into each barrel, uh, into, into each uh, wine process. And so because of that, the wine had a more uh, uh, reproducible result, consistent result with consistent levels of alcohol. And uh, Louis Pasteur really revolutionized this alcohol production. It was very interesting stuff. What was another question at the time? Remember the four questions we were talking about before? Well, another major question was what causes disease? Why does disease happen? And, and I'm not talking about genetic diseases. Um, we're talking about dis communicable diseases, diseases that you can catch, right, or spread, you know, to others. What causes disease? People had no idea. But a growing theory at the time was the theory of germ theory, that germs, microorganisms are responsible for disease. And you know, uh, Pasteur developed this theory of germ theory, but it was this gentleman here at the bottom right, Robert Koch, who studied the causative agents of disease, also known as ideology. What does that mean, causative agents of disease? Well, when I get this skin infection, what exact organism is causing that skin organism? For example, have you heard of staph infections? Well, that means that a type of staphylococcus is causing the skin infection. I could get a skin infection that causes black lesions called eschars, and that would be caused by a different microorganism. That would be caused by anthrax. Anthrax would cause black lesions in my skin. But if I get a different kind of uh, skin lesion, if I get uh, something that looks like a spider bite but is caused by bacteria, that would be a staphylococcus infection. So Robert Koch was the first to develop a way of linking a particular culprit, which means a particular, in this case, what I mean by that is a particular uh, uh, organism to a particular disease, right? Does that make sense? So how did he do that? Well, first of all, he needed to figure out how to even grow these organisms in the lab. Remember, microbiology was a budding field at the time. This is the early 1800s. This is the 1800s at the time. Microbiology is an, a budding field. Uh, Petri dishes and broth and media and all the stuff that we work with in the lab didn't exist at the time, right? So Koch's lab was actually integral in the production of many of these simple techniques, these micro, uh, microbiology techniques to grow bacteria, to spread bacteria, to, to, to grow them so that they don't become contaminated, to, um, to uh, study them, to understand them, right? So look at some of the things that came from Koch's laboratory. Koch's uh, experiments resulted in simple staining where you could stain the cells. The first picture of bacteria, the first picture of bacteria in disease tissue, uh, techniques to figure out how many bacteria there are, uh, the use of steam to sterilize media. You need to sterilize things so that you have a, uh, a, a culture that you could grow bacteria in without getting contamination, uh, the use of petri dishes, the techniques to transfer the bacteria without contaminating the bacteria. Uh, and, and so the whole concept that bacteria have these distinct species, I mean, all of these concepts came from his lab. And, and because 
these uh, this laid the foundation for microbiology and the lab work involved with microbiology we were able to start linking a particular bacteria to a particular disease right let me just show you before i explain how he did that how he linked a bacteria to a disease let me show you this you know what this is at the bottom right it's a picture of a petri dish a petri dish which has bacteria growing on it you see this this circle here that would be called a bacterial colony you see this that's a bacterial colony that's a bacterial colony here each one of these circular blobs is a bacteria colony so what you have is a dish this dish is called a petri dish and did you know that petri was actually a member of koch's lab and and petri came up with this type of dish <laughs> this is like a fun fact for you and do you see this uh red stuff inside of the dish this stuff is called agar this this gooey stuff is agar okay agar is a medium a solid medium which is full of uh, nutrients bacteria can grow on agar right and each one of these circular structures is a colony of bacteria so what is a colony I want you to understand this before we move on what are you looking at here you see when I point to this here you see this circle when I point to this and call this a bacteria colony what do I mean okay and when I point to this one how come this one's yellow and how come this one's white and how come this one's uh, this one's uh, kind of different from this one and this one's def different from all the other ones and this one's definitely has it's not circular at all it's got this uh, irregular edge right so why are all these different so let me answer that before we move on because this is quite important actually especially if you're not gonna see it up close in the lab for a while so let me show you this is a bacterial colony I can see it right you might say but Dr. D I thought you said you can't see bacteria bacteria are prokaryotes and they're single cell and you can't see them with your naked eye but guess what I can see this colony you know why because these are billions of bacteria these are actually billions of bacteria in this circle okay billions that's why I see it but why do they all look why does this colony look different than this colony well because this would be one species of bacteria this is one species of bacteria and that would be a different species of bacteria this would be one bacteria that's a different bacteria does that make sense now why are there a billion of them here's what you need to understand okay this is actually quite tricky but you can do it so at some point this was a sterile dish which means there were no colonies on this dish does that make sense then let's say I took some uh, sample from the environment and I spread it on the dish would I see anything on the dish if I took let's say I took a q-tip and I look here bear with me for a second let's say I had a dish and it was just a sterile dish you wouldn't see any colonies on the dish let's say I took a q-tip and I touched it to a doorknob or something and then I spread it on the plate would you see any bacteria on the plate no you actually wouldn't see any bacteria but would there be some bacteria on the plate yes you know look there would be maybe one one cell one bacteria of some type here one bacteria of some type there one bacteria here one here one here one here from the doorknob does that make sense so then what do you do you put this plate in the incubator which is like a um, a warm environment a nice warm environment where bacteria can grow and do you know what happens the one bacteria that was sitting here that you couldn't see becomes two and then that becomes four and then that becomes eight right and that goes 16 and so on and so forth and next thing you know you have billions of bacteria that you can see so each and every one of the bacteria in this colony is a clone of each other does that make sense so for example if this is a uh, staphylococcus aureus bacteria there was one original one original staphylococcus bacteria staphylococcus aureus that became two exact copies of the same bacteria which became four which became eight which became 16 which became 32 does that make sense so now you have billions of the same exact 
cell, the, the same, uh, the same, basically uh, clones of uh, one another. That's why they call this a clonal colony. Every single bacteria in this circle, all every single one of the billions in this circle are clones of one another. They're all Staphylococcus aureus, for example, and they're all exact clones. Whereas in this colony, those are all exact copies of a different species. That might be uh, anthrax or something, a different bacteria. Okay, so now you understand how the plates work. So what? how did Koch, after he developed all of these techniques and after he figured out how to you know, identify species from one another and isolate. These are called isolated colonies. This is an isolated colony. This is an isolated colony, right? Once he figured out how to isolate colonies, then the concept of linking a bacteria to a disease became possible. So let's talk about that. What bacteria causes what disease? Remember, Koch was instrumental in this. Uh, and he, what Koch realized was that if you follow these four steps, these are called his postulates, Koch's postulates are four steps. If you follow these four steps, you can link a bacteria to a disease. So what did he find? He found that the suspected causative agent or the specific bacteria must be found in every case of the disease, but absent from healthy hosts. Okay, so if I have lab rats, okay, let's say I have 100 lab rats, only the lab rats that are suffering with uh, a disease should have the bacteria. The healthy lab rats should not harbor that bacteria. That makes sense, right? Then the agent must be isolated and grown outside of the host. So let's say, let's say I have 100 lab rats. 50 of them have these black scars on their on their skin and 50 of them don't have the black scars on their skin. If I were to take skin samples, right, swabs from all the rats, I should find the bacteria I'm interested in. Uh, let's say it's like this this like yellow colony. I should find these yellow bacteria only on the skin of the infected rats and not on the skin of the non-infected rats. Does that make sense? Then, what do I do? When that agent, that bacteria, is introduced into a healthy, susceptible host, like a rat in this case, the host must get the disease. So what, do I, what does that mean? Let's say I got this colony from a skin swab of a sick rat. If I were to take these bacteria and then deposit them on the skin of a healthy rat, that rat should also get the black lesions. Does that make sense to you? And then what did he do? Just to confirm, he, he had to be able to get the same bacteria, the same agent from the diseased host again. So that rat that I made sick with the black lesions, if I were to swab that rat's skin later on, I should be able to grow that bacteria, that colony again. And I could do it again if I want to. I could take this bacteria and infect another rat and the rat should get the skin lesions again. Does that make sense? So by following these four postulates called Koch's postulates, I'm able to link a particular disease to a particular uh, microorganism. And a bunch of scientists did this. Here's a list. Uh, Albert Neisser, for example, he was the one who was able to use Koch's postulates to link the disease gonorrhea to the bacteria Neisseria gonorrheae. Okay, so you see all these back, all these um, all these scientists were able to use Koch's postulates to figure out what bacteria is is causing gonorrhea what bacteria is causing typhoid fever what bacteria is causing bacterial pneumonia etc very interesting stuff okay and then lastly we really wanted to know how can we prevent infection and disease 
and some of the early pioneers of prevention of infection and disease were in the medical field, right? They were nurses, they were doctors. So let's talk about some of these people. Ignace Samuelways was an early pioneer in the early 1800s to mid-1800s who discovered hand washing, the, the benefits of hand washing. He was one of the first to implement hand washing and he saw great success with uh, patients surviving after hand washing. Joseph Lister was a surgeon. He was one of the first to understand that uh, germ, theory, germ theory is real and when you're doing surgical procedures, medical surgical procedures, you should treat your surgical, uh, you know, your blades and your, and your tools, you should use, you should treat your surgical instruments with uh, disinfectants and sterilants and he would use phenol. Phenol would kill the bacteria on the saw blade if he had to do an amputation for example and this was amazing by treating the tissue or the tools with phenol uh, by killing the bacteria these people got fewer infections and the patients survived. Florence Nightingale she was a very famous nurse, English nurse who was one of the first proponents of using cleanliness and other antiseptic techniques into nursing which helped save countless lives. Edward Jenner, he was one of the first to discover the benefits of, uh, uh, of the immune system by, by figuring out the concept of vaccination. He would take uh, pus from a milkmaid's cowpox lesion, introduce it to other hosts and those hosts would become vaccinated to that cowpox. So the concept of vaccines was really pioneered by Edward Jenner and actually also Louis Pasteur. Here's another, Alexander Fleming, very famous, very important microbiologist, discovered antibiotics. It, he discovered penicillin and by accident too this was a serendipitous accident that means a lucky accident here's what here's what Fleming did he streaked bacteria you see this opaque zigzag right here this is bacteria that Fleming had added to a plate when he came back after incubating he noticed this white fuzzy thing well you know what this white fuzzy thing is it's a type of fungus called penicillium he wasn't trying to grow this fungus. He wasn't trying to grow penicillium. So a lot of scientists, you know what they would have done? They would have just thrown this plate away. Why? Because he wanted to grow this bacteria zigzag. He did not want to grow this fuzzy fun fungus. That's what's called a contaminant, right? But lucky for Fleming and lucky for humanity, um, he took a look at this plate. And what did he see? What do you see here? What do you see here? are the bacteria, which is this opaque zigzag, are the bacteria growing and touching the fungus? What is this? No, this is what's called a zone of inhibition. This is an area. Zone of inhibition means an area where bacteria can't grow, right? So you know what that suggested to Alexander Fleming? It suggested that the mold, in this case the mold penicillium, must be secreting some kind of juice. In fact, he called it mold juice at the time. He, they didn't know what it was, so they called it mold juice. So this mold is secreting some mold juice, and that juice is preventing the bacteria from growing, right? So now we know that this juice included the antibiotic protein called penicillin right? Penicillin. And penicillin is a molecule that inhibits bacterial growth. Penicillin inhibits growth of uh, bacteria. Okay? Uh, it's an antibiotic. And that helped to cure millions, if not billions of people up till now <laughs> with uh, infections that could have otherwise been very serious or deadly, right? So very, very important stuff. The microbiology was uh, discovered in the 1800s, but 
since then it's it's saved countless 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 people uh, between antibiotics between uh, vaccinations between understanding germ theory uh, understanding how to wash your hands understanding how viruses work understanding how to you know do surgeries properly without disease how to prevent disease spread all of this is thanks to microbiology and uh, your very health is probably uh, led to microbiology very very important stuff so that leads us to the end of this chapter I hope you learned a lot uh, relatively short chapter for chapter one thank you for hanging out with me and learning uh, le leave any questions you have in the comment box below and I'll catch you guys next time Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, I Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, I Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, I Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D.